You are now listening to Nailed It, the orthopedic surgery podcast. Dr. Cohen Rosenblum, welcome to the Nailed It Ortho podcast. I am uh, happy to have you on and looking forward to this talk. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And today we're going to talk some hips. We're going to talk some uh, some femoral fixation in total hip arthroplasty. But, you know, at the beginning, kind of what we like to do is just talk to our guests a little bit, get to know them a little bit better, and then we can jump into the topic of the day if that works with you. Yeah, sounds great. So I guess first question is because, you know, we have we have residents that listen to this. There may be some third year resident that's deciding between two specialties right now and joints may be one of their specialties or adult reconstruction. So what made you choose to go into the you know the specialty of adult reconstruction out of all the different specialties? So a few different things. So I was actually just listening to the episode you did with Dr. Gray, who was one of my attendings in residency and in his amazing episode. And actually all your listeners should just turn off this episode <laughs> and go listen to that one right now because I'm sure it's better. Um, it's so good. Uh-huh. And there's, I like think ham stuff is so boring and he even talks about arthritis and has so many smart things to say. So um, Dr. Gray's listen, awesome. listen to Dr. Gray's episode <laughs> and end of show. No, um, so he, is, he mentioned, I think you asked him why he wanted to do hand. And I believe he said something about he didn't want to do inpatient stuff and he wanted to do something that was hard. And you right. could kind of, I was thinking about it. I was like, he's probably going to ask me why I want to do joints for this one. <laughs> and I thought, well, it's kind of like what Dr. Gray said, but like the opposite. So I like the inpatient stuff and I want, I kind of like something that's easier, although Ah. joints is also difficult, but easy in the sense of, I like the predictability of doing sort of the similar types of procedures and, and then practicing perfection at it, right. Trying to get as efficient as possible, doing the sort of same kind of thing over and over again, which, you know, that's what the cool thing I think about orthopedics and medicine in general, whatever your personality is, if you like the unexpected, if you like unpredictability, or if you're like boring, like me and like to plan everything, um, there's something for you. So that's one reason, um, that I like joints. Although my fellowship director, Tom Brown, he used to say, he's like, some people say that, um, there's only two surgeries in, in joints, but really you think about it, there's a right knee, a left knee, a right hip, a left hip, and then revision. So that's like eight right there. That's so true. That's a lot eight. of different, a lot of different kinds of surgeries. It's a lot. Um, so that that's one. And then the other one is um, I did in like between undergrad and med school, I did a master's in bioarchaeology where I looked at like skeletal remains and stuff. And one of the reason that I like got interested in orthopedics in the first place was looking at skeletal pathology and sort of thinking about like, you know, looking at these archaeological specimens and the skeletal pathology, how could we actually intervene on, you know, alive people to help them? And that's what got me, you know, interested in medicine as well as orthopedics. Um, And one of the, lot of the main things you can see on skeletal pathology is arthritis, right? You can see evidence of that right. in these bones. You can see osteophytes, you can see eburnation of the, of the bones, which is when the cartilage is worn away so much that the bone is shiny and sclerotic like ivory. I'm sure you've seen that in the OR. Um, and so, you know, that sort of image of those um, specimens kind of stayed with me. And that's kind of the main thing you address with arthroplasty, right? Is arthritis. So, so Very I think both true. of those reasons. Oh, that's awesome. I think those are, um, you know, good reasons and definitely the predictability and, you know, there's still so much, you know, different things in that you can get dive into, you know, when you're talking about arthroplasty and such as balancing and all these different things. Um, but no, I think uh, arthroplasty is cool and, you know, great procedures. And one of the things that you mentioned, I want to dive a little bit deeper on, or I was going to ask you about it. So maybe, maybe you brought it up. It was your degree in archaeology where you went abroad. This was not in the U.S. If I if I am correct, this is something that you were actually in uh, in school in in London in the U.K. And I always find it interesting when you know you're used to a U.S. system and you go to a different system. So kind of what was that experience like? Yeah, I mean that was it was really fun. So in undergrad, I was a big nerd. I mean, I guess I still am, but I studied classical archaeology, which is like combination of archaeology and classics, which is like Greek and Latin literature. So I focused on Greek. So I did Greek literature and Greek archaeology. And then I knew that I was interested in medicine, but I was also, you know, so someone had told me that, you know, once you start medicine, 
that's kind of like a train that lasts for a lot of years and it's hard to get off of it and take a break and do other stuff, um, which so plenty of people do and they take researchers and stuff. But I think, I don't know if you agree or not, but I think that's to a certain extent true. Like once you start medical school, it's sort of a many years process. So I thought, you know, why not before med school, you know, have kind of one last um, more in-depth exploration of archaeology. So I got a scholarship to go to University College London uh, Institute of Archaeology. And I got a master's degree there in, they call it skeletal and dental bioarchaeology, or they say it's skeletal. Um, skeletal. And, like <laughs> <laughs> and so it was, you know, kind of like forensics a little bit, but it was um, looking at, um, you know, archaeological specimens. Someone told me I shouldn't talk about human remains because that sounds creepy. Oh, so go I'm for call, it. I'm calling them archaeological Wherever it goes, specimens. wherever the bombo goes. <laughs> This is what we do here. So we looked at, you know, uh, skeletal specimens from their collections and it's learning anatomy and learning pathology. Um, and a lot of the bones that I definitely don't think about anymore, like the skull um, and teeth, because there was that dental part of that. So we even had like one of our exams was like 10 teeth lined up and you had to like take 10 minutes at each station and like write down which tooth it was and oh, wow. what was wrong with it and all that stuff. So it was a lot of fun and it was... Um, uh, there were master's degrees over there is like a calendar year. So it was like September to September. So over here, it's two years with like summer breaks. But over there, it was a calendar year with no break. But the last three months, you write your thesis. So that's um, that's how I did that. But it was cool. great. I lived in London. I lived in um, like student housing with international student housing in this gorgeous neighborhood. And the building was like so ugly, but it was great because we didn't have to look at the building because we were in the building. So I got right. to like look out at all the beautiful other nice houses and in this like, you know, yellow dorm Clifford Pew house. That's where I was in Swiss cottage in the neighborhood. Bell that, Park area. that sounds awesome. Sounds like it a great was. experience. Super it was. fun. It was great. I and, highly and, recommend <laughs> And last question I have for you is, I know you're relatively new in the overall kind of career of, of being, you know, an attending out on your own practicing any advice, because we sometimes have some fellows that listen to this or new attendings, any advice that you would give or anything, I guess, that you've learned, you know, over the past you know, couple of years as being a new attending that you may not have thought of in the, in the beginning or, you know, just something that you're like, oh, well, I wish I would have known this when I started off. Yeah, absolutely. So I started in 2018. So I've had, you know, three, four years now to sort of get my feet wet, but I'm still learning. You know, I think, I think it's true. I don't know where I heard this, but I, someone said that, you know, residency, you're learning a lot about all the different aspects of orthopedics and you know, you're learning how to operate, but the time you learn the most is in your first five years of practice. And I think that's totally true. You learn a lot about how you operate and how you teach and how you interact with patients because now you're in charge. Right. So um, I think one of the things I would recommend that I learned the hard way, you know, when you first start, I made a point of, okay, let's introduce myself to the CMO and the head of radiology and the head of anesthesia and the head of, you know, all these different departments. And what I didn't think about was looking, you know, talking to the clinic managers, the people that answer the phones, the MAs, mm. like they're the ones that make actually the biggest difference in your day-to-day -day life, yeah. you know, the floor nursing, the charge nurses, like that's what, and eventually, <laughs> eventually I figured it out, but like, that's the kind of thing I would highly recommend when you start out, just like bringing some donuts, telling the schedulers like what you do, because you can't assume um, that they know that someone in an, a graduating from an adult reconstruction fellowship is going to, you know, treat hip pain, knee pain, usually over 50 revisions, right? Like they're not necessarily going to know that. So introducing yourself, telling people what you do, it's just going to make a huge difference in the long term and in, in your success and growing your practice. So I think I would definitely recommend that. That is awesome. I hope people are listening to this take notes, you know, throughout my time <laughs> doing this podcast, I, I started to take notes from, you know, each, each guest. And there's always something you can learn from everybody. So that is definitely another gem and piece of advice that I will take uh, with myself in the future. And I hope some of those that are listening will also do so. And um, switching gears now, and we can kind of talk a little bit about, you know, kind of total hip arthroplasty and cementless femoral fixation, which I think it's a good topic. I remember, you know, being a junior and looking at x-rays and our attendings asking what, what it is. And I'm like, well, it's a total hip. And they're like, okay, well, what kind of an implant is it? And I'm like, I don't what know. What is like, the model <laughs> number? <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not sure. Um, so I think this will be good to kind of go over, um, you know, kind of the general of, you know, total hip arthroplasty and especially these are, are femoral stems 
And this will be a little bit different than our normal talk for those that are listening on the audio podcast. We also have a YouTube component that has pictures if you want to check out some of the pictures of some of the things that we're talking about. But again, we will try to describe this as best as we can over audio. And um, Dr. Cohen Rosenblum, if what we could do is kind of just kind of give a, a just a little bit of a, a general background when we're kind of talking about these these different stems and different implants. So like what is you know, we, we have proximally coded, we have all this stuff we hear about osteo integration, like what, what is or what are some of these topics? Like, what do they mean? And just to give us a, a general basis of where we can kind of build on. Yeah, so um, first of all, um, I highly recommend that everybody check out the JBJS current concepts review paper um, with Antonia Chen um, from the Brigham and her colleagues. That's the from 2020, an update on cementless femoral fixation and total hip arthroplasty, because a lot of the concepts we're going to discuss today are sort of distilled from that. Um, so really great paper. Highly recommend you check it out. I'm constantly like referencing it, showing residents. Um, so I think that's highly recommended to to your listeners. Yes, yeah, great, great paper. And, and then shout out to Dr. Chen. She was one of the guests on our podcast a while back. So shout out to Dr. Chen. But yeah, yeah so paper. everybody pause, turn this off and go listen to <laughs> no. Antonio Chen's episode Continue. now. <laughs> so you could do that too. And then and then maybe if you have time, come back, come back to this one. Um, so, I mean, look, I think the first, and, and you'll have to just like cut me off at some point, just, just mute or something. Cause you, you'll talk to the residents who work with me. I could just talk about this stuff for like hours and hours and go on all these tangents. But I think the most important concept is fixation for total hip arthroplasty. Like the initial total hips in the 1960s from Sir John Charnley were cemented. They were cemented monoblock um, hip stems. So monoblock meaning that the head and the stem were all one piece. Now, I think um, a lot of our you know, residents and listening to this, you're probably familiar with the total hip that's a separate from stem and the, the, the head is like a separate piece. So the original total hips, the, the head and the stem were all together. It was okay. cemented and the cup was also cemented and the cup was made of polyethylene. So um, that was the original total hip. And then over time, they developed different types of implants. Um, and then I believe it was in the 1980s that they uh, started be becoming more common to do cementless fixation. So cemented fixation is when, you know, you, if I'm sure you've done this, hopefully, and at least for the Hemi on call, right. You, um, right. clean out the canal, take your cement gun, put in your restrictor, um, take your cement gun, you know, put the cement into the femoral canal, pressurize it, and then you, you know, gradually insert your metal stem. And then what happens is there's cement mantle that interdigitates with the bone and then keeps the implant in place. And that's a massive oversimplification. Okay. Then in contrast to that, um, cementless fixation relies on the interface between the bone and the implant itself. Okay. So um, you basically have your, the materials on the implant that interact with your bone to cause bony ingrowth and on growth. And those are two slightly different concepts, but that is what provides your fixation. Okay. And can we dive a little bit deeper into that? Just, so what is the difference between ingrowth and on growth when we're talking about kind of the surfacing of these different implants right so ingrowth is where you have like a porous surface uh, whether it's mesh or beads or something like that the bone grows into that coating and on growth is where you have some kind of coated surface grit blasted um, plasma sprayed uh, and the bone grows on top of it and and grit can we, can we quickly touch on grit blasting and plasma spraying what are i know it sounds like, general, like you're like in a sci-fi movie <laughs> but it's, it's just different ways of treating the implant so um and just to clarify so in growth the um you know we were saying how the bone goes into the pores of the surface and on growth you make the surface itself rough and then the bone grows onto it. Okay. So okay. just, you know, do I know what machine they use to plasma spray or whatever? No, but they treat the surface of the bone so that now it's roughened and the bone grows on top of it. Ah, okay. And, and what material are 
the implants mostly made of or mostly like titanium that most people are using or cobalt chrome or you know so what are some of the titanium in the modern implants or t- titanium is most common for the stems cobalt chrome is still used for heads although um in the past 10 years so like when i started training we would use mostly cobalt chrome heads and then ceramic heads for sort of younger people. And now I think the literature has shown that with the cobalt chrome heads and the titanium stud, you have more risk of potential trunnionosis, um, which is sort of corrosion at that head neck junction causing metallosis similar to what you would find with like a metal on metal implant. Um, and so for the most part now, I believe, and you know, I can't speak for everybody, but most people are using a titanium stud with a ceramic head. Ah, okay. For okay. most primary implants. For most, for most primary, um, the total hip arthroplasty. Mm-hmm. And again, just to reiterate, you were saying that ingrowth is when the bone actually, again, grows inside of the porous surface and there can be different types of surfaces on the implant. And these are things that we got from the, from, not from Dr. Chen's paper, there was actually a, an older paper that I had found that I was looking at. And thank God you sent me Dr. Chen's paper while I was going through that paper <laughs> because it was very in-depth and in detail and completely different as far as um, as far as the different types of implants. But um, so again, for surfacing, so in-growth bone is going to again, grow inside of the uh, pore surface. And then for on-growth bone grows onto the roughened outer surface. And again, that surface can be treated by like grit blasting or plasma spraying, you know, different things of that, of that sort. I think people just like to say grit blasting and plasma spray. It, it sounds, sounds cool. cool. If you it think sounds about really it. cool. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like, yeah, you got a grit blasted. You know, I, you know when I was in, I just said when I was in high school, I was at a job as a grit blaster. You know, you could say something like that, right? That sounds like a cool thing to be doing. But anyway, I definitely no, was sound- not doing grit blasting in high school. That sound, I mean, it's, I think it's cool to put on your resume. Something something to ask about for, uh, you know, if we have a residence applying for fellowship and you put grit blasting or plasma Yeah, I'm a grit blaster. And your academic, in your um, hobbies, I'm sure that'll, somebody will bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So, you know, those are kind of the, the general over, you know, overview of things. You know, we, you start off with a monoblock back in, uh, or in, in the day, I guess you could say, where, you know, you're. Um, your stem and your head was all one piece, but again, now it's a little bit different. Our stem and our head is, is different piece. And we talked about in-growth versus on-growth and then some of the different surfacing for uh, these different types of, you know, different types of implants. So I guess we'll get to the meat of the talk, which is the, des- the design for our cementless thermal design. So can we, can you kind of give us an overview of the different types of design? And then we'll go and try to talk about, you know, spend a couple of minutes talking about each design type and, you know, the important things to know about them. Sure. So um, I think the first per- thing to say is, you know, we love classifications in orthopedics and there's certain classifications that are kind of used universally. I would think like the Shasker classification, the Vancouver classification, the, I think with femoral stem design, there is not one universally acknowledged classification. I think that's why they keep coming out with these papers, right? To right. reflect the new classifications. That's one thing. So this is the paper we're referencing is a great paper, very useful, but it's by no means like the, the end all be all of classification. And I, you know, you're closer to this than I am, but I don't think they're going to be testing you on that. Like, what is it? Nope, like? One step, you know what I mean? Like, so <laughs> it's, not. I think of it more as a tool to try and, conceptualize all the different types of implants. And if that helps you grade, and if there's another way that you like to think of it, fine. So for me, um, you know, once we have the first like um, decision of cementless versus cemented. So now we're looking at cementless stems. There's tons of ways to think about it. So one way you can think about it is where the porous coating is, right? The porous coating that causes your ingrowth. So you can have porous coating proximally and you can have porous coating distally and you can have porous coating everywhere. So that's one way to think about it. And the other way to think of it is modularity. Um, Modularity just means having more than one like part of the stem, if that makes sense. So for example, like we're talking about the original monoblock stems, they did not have any modularity because you had the head connected to the stem. Technically right now, every modern total hip is modular in the sense that you have a stem and then you have a separate ball or head that you impact onto it. But for the, for all intents and purposes, 
when we're talking about these stems, modularity refers to additional pieces than that, right? So if we assume you have a stem and a ball that's separate, additional modularity means like a separate proximal body and a separate distal part, or even a separate neck and a body and a distal part. So that's one way to think of it. Um, you know, whether it's modular or not, where the fixation is. And then finally, you have this type of classification, which is more based on stem design. So that's sort of an overview. And, and that, like I said, many different ways to think about it. No, um, I think that was great. And just to reiterate, you're saying, you know, first thing you can have is, you know, it, where there's a porous coating is a proximal, is a distal, or the, it was just the entire thing uh, coated versus, you know, look at the modularity and, and I guess, I mean, I guess now, I, to, just like you said, technically all of them are modular, but you can have differing levels of modularity in the implant. And in Southern North, I think you're going to continue on and talk about, I guess, these, this type in this paper that we're referencing. Right. So I guess you, we should just start with type one, I suppose. Sure. So type ones are just the shorties. Um, and they, they go into way more detail than I'm probably going to talk about here, but they just are shorter than regular non-short <laughs> And I think right. they define it. There's many different ways to define it. I think they said, what was 120? Um, yeah, less than 120, I think they or said. Or something like that. Yeah. So either way, it's a <laughs> shorter than normal stem. Um, so the question is why, right? <laughs> like, why do right. these exist? Um, I think as a sidebar, like total hip is a great op uh, operation and the design is pretty successful. Um we're always seeking to improve and change. And sometimes that helps us. And I feel like sometimes it doesn't. Um, but I think the, the theory with these short stems is that, right, the, the shorter the stem, the more bone you preserve in terms of um, the proximal femur, right? So I think there are some who would advocate for using these short stems for everybody, especially younger people that you want to preserve bone and you're um, worried about a risk of revision. But I would argue like the, the, uh, long-term outcomes for, you know, regular length primary total hips are so good. I don't necessarily think personally that that is a, a good enough reason to use them. There are situations in which you have like some weird proximal femur anatomy that you don't think you're going to be able to get a normal length stem down, um, that a shorty would be useful. And I think I have an example of this we can go over later. Um, and there's a lot of different designs of them. They can be kind of confusing. Some look just like a regular stem, but short. And then the other one, my favorite, um, are we allowed to say brand names? I don't know if you have. Yeah, like, yeah, go for that. it. So there's the Depew Proxima, which I call the chicken nugget because it looks just okay. like a chicken nugget. I think that's yeah, the picture that you have on there. Yeah, it looks like a chicken nugget. This one? Um, yeah, yeah, that's the chicken nugget, right? Doesn't it kind of look like a chicken nugget? <laughs> it looks kind of looks. <laughs> I was actually talking to Dr. Chen. I was like, why didn't you put the chicken nugget in there as a subclassification? <laughs> she was not amused. Um, but no, uh, so that there's all these different types and you can look into them, but they just have different types of designs and they have different, different uses. So our, I guess one question. So are all these pretty much most of these are, since they're so short, are they all fully coated for the most part or almost most of the implanters is, is going to be has some type of a porous coating on it yeah it's it's weird because you can have you can have a stem that's fully porous coated that's a short stem but i think it's sort of misleading to say that because when we talk about fully porous coated to me that means a stem that has metaphyseal and diaphyseal engagement like the depew aml right so um which is a different thing. Like I think that's that five B um, versus fully porous coated short stem. So I guess I would sort of stay away from that terminology and then talk about more metaphyseal and diaphyseal engagement. So a short stem by definition is only going to engage the metaphysis. So if you have a fully porous coated short stem, it's going to be metaphysially engaging. So Does that any, make sense at all? Yeah, that makes sense. So, so any patient that has, you know, like some metaphyseal bone loss, this likely is not the stem that we would choose because you need some good metaphyseal bone. Right, That's where you're, your fixation not, is. you're not going to get more fixation to sleep. I, I would, I would agree with that. And then it's debatable. Like um, if you have metaphyseal bone that's present, but it's been instrumented before, maybe for previous procedures, like a pinning femoral neck fracture or something like that. Um, you could argue, you know, that bone has also been compromised. So maybe not a great idea. 
Um, but you'll see after you pass your boards, you can kind of do whatever you want. <laughs> no, 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 nobody's, nobody's <laughs> do whatever it is. <laughs> and and another another question I have is um, in you know these one of these talks about uh, like to type for example type one D they talk about a short tapered stem not a stapered stem <laughs> if anybody's looking at the uh, yeah. slides um, but can you quickly go over kind of what a tapered stem is just so you know sometimes we have medical students listen to this too and just so they have a general idea of of what an actual taper is and what you'd be looking for. I mean, it just refers to sort of the geometry of the stem and whether it like tapers down and gets thinner or whether it's cylindrical and just stays as a cylinder the whole time. I'm just massively simplifying. So hopefully, okay. Hopefully that's no, helpful. I think that's, I mean, that's, that's really all you need. And so our type ones are going to be this, like you said, the short stems, which uh, all their, most of their fixations in the metaphysis of the, uh, of the proximal femur. So you need a good bone stock. And so those are short ones that, people are using and you know again like you said some people are using those because they think it's more bone preserving so can we kind of talk about i guess our next type or our type two stems that they actually allude to in this article and we can kind of discuss the shape of these stems yeah so the type two there are the single wedge stems or the blade stems there's probably going to be the most common ones you see out there um and actually, this is a plug for the AGRR, so the American Joint Replacement Registry, which is, you know, collecting data on you know, big data on joint replacements in the United States. They publish a report every year and they go into greater detail about what kinds of stems are being used across the whole country. Um, so that's, I believe, going to be one of the most common stems out there. But you can look at more detail on that report every year. Um, so the, the blade stems or the single wedge stems. Um, I think the key there, it's, it's a single wedge. That's why I like joints. It's fairly simple. Um, <laughs> the single wedge stem contains a single wedge uh, and you have to kind of wedge it as it were into the proximal femur. To, so that's how you get rotational stability. Uh, and it's and also proximally porous coated. So proximally porous coated. And when you say single wedge, you mean in just the, like just the medial and lateral plane. Like, so if you look at it from the side, there, there's no wedge. It's the same, I guess, thickness you could say throughout. But if you look at it from the front, it'll, 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 it'll be different, I guess, sizes per se. Right. And that's how, like, let's say, you know, unless you're really familiar with all how the different implants look on x-ray and you're trying to figure out, is this single wedge? Is this double wedge? You can usually, you may not be able to tell as much on the AP because on the AP x-ray, you see that filling up the metaphysis, you know, uh, with both with the single and double wedge. But if you look on the cross table lateral, um, that will probably be able to help you figure out the difference between a single wedge and a, and a double wedge. Okay. And, and like you mentioned, these are going to be uh, proximally coated around the metaphyseal region. So they get most of their fixation in the metaphyseal bone. And this is again, something that you use, you know, good long-term outcomes that you use for your primary total hips. Right. right. So similar to what you were saying about the shorties, if you don't have good metaphyseal bone, you probably don't want to use this type of stem, which okay. it relies on metaphyseal fixation. So what is the, I guess the main difference between the single wedge and the double wedge stems and what would make somebody choose? That's one thing I always, you know, you go to the these different meetings and there's like eight stems on the table and you're trying to figure out what the difference between them and like why you'd use one versus the other, uh, which I guess is the point of this talk. But so I want, can we talk about the, the dual wedge stem and what makes that different from the single wedge stem and when you may use one versus the other? So first of all, I would say, I don't think there's data to prove that either of these two is superior. You know what I mean? I think okay, it's honestly, right. I think it's just preference, like patient preference. So Personally, well, so we go into so the double wedge. So that's, you can also refer to as a fit and fill. So the idea is that you, it's thicker. So it has two wedges, you know, in the AP and the ML sort of planes, as opposed to the blade stem or the single wedge. So it fills up the metaphysis more. Um, so, and again, you're in a normal primary total hip with intact metaphyseal bone. I think you're fine to do either one. Personally, I prefer the this type the fit and fill or the double wedge um just not for like super scientific regions i just think it makes sense right you're like right. filling it up more why more is better right why not um i'm sure someone could argue against me about that the other thing is 
you know, if, especially if I'm um, doing a primer on someone, maybe their bone is not the best, but it's not bad enough that I'm thinking about cement. Um, maybe I don't want to be doing, and again, this is not super scientific. Maybe I don't want to be doing a single wedge because you have, you do it to get adequate fixation. You really have to wedge it in there. Right. Um, and so you, ha you probably have to be banging it a little harder than you would with a double wedge to get that fixation. Right. So that's another potential consideration. And anyway, there's not going to be, I don't think any kind of paper saying that one way or the other, that's just my sort of weird thoughts about it. And in one, I guess, more question, I guess, technical question, when you're actually doing the, the cases, when you're doing the, the single wedge stem, I guess maybe we can touch on the difference between broaching and reaming. And I guess it would, it, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but broaching your, when you're kind of making the guide for where your stem's going to go, it's important to stay in that same plane because this is actually where the, you know, where the stem is going to, I mean, where, where it's going to fit, uh, you know, I guess, can you, can you touch on the, on, I guess, just what part does broaching slash reaming have to do with the type of stem? Right. So reaming and broaching are different things. So reaming is like when you're doing a femoral nail or something, right? And you have your reamer and you, it's on a drill and you, um, not on drill, it's on ream, but it's like attached to like the, the guide. Um, right. And you, you put it into the femur, it spins around and it like makes a space for your nail, right? So that's what reaming is. So similar concept when you're reaming for a system, a stem design that involves reaming. So certain stem designs, usually whether it's, it's, it's either gonna be certain types of the double wedge stems or the fit and fill stems. For example, the summit, that's a ream and broach system. Um, and versus the wedge, single wedge of the blade stems are broach only. So reaming is making like space in the bone with a reamer. You'll do that for certain double wedge systems. You'll do that for fully porous coated stems. You'll do that for uh, your modular distally porous, uh, distally coated stems. So those all require reaming. The um, single wedge stems and some of the designs for the dual wedge stems are brooch only. And broaching is when you take like a, a a brooch which opens up the femur and it's the brooch is designed to match the geometry of the femoral stem but in like a smaller size that you can get progressively bigger until you match the size of the implant that you're actually going to put in um so and you just like mallet it in as opposed to the reamer right where you put it on your power and spin it around um so there's in systems that are ream and brooch you ream first to open up the canal distally um, and then use your brooch in bigger and bigger sizes until you get a good fit for the brooch only systems. You just start with a, you open up the canal and then start with the brooch and get successively larger sizes until you get that good wedge. Ah, okay. Perfect. Does that Thank you. Does that yes. Question? No, that answered it perfectly. And I'm sure there's some poor, not poor, but I'm sure there's some second year resident on joints who you just cleared to, you know, to clear that whole thing up for at least they understand the operation a little bit more when they go into the I will tomorrow. say, and to just make things more confusing in the system I use, if I'm broaching and I feel like the brooch isn't going down as far as I needed to go, maybe because they're like a door A and the bone is like really good in yeah. the isthmus or something, um, then I sometimes I will ream just a little bit to open that up, even though that's technically not doesn't have to be right? right, but to have that available, so you can mix and match. So even in a system that's supposed to be broach only, sometimes you can also read. Okay, and and moving forward, so we talked about the single wedge, we talked about the dual wedge. I guess can we kind of talk about what makes and those were type two and type three respectively. What are I guess our type four stems, or I guess how would you describe them? I would describe them how you can read about it in the paper. It's just a different, <laughs> it's just a different yeah. kind of design. We don't usually use that, I think, as much in this country. I think it's more of a uh, help you look cool reading other x-rays. Um, it's, you know, proximally porous coated. Um, and, you know, they have like various different designs um, that you'll see out there. Some, some of them have sort of, 
fins or ribs to help with rotational stability but it's kind of more of a of a curiosity look at the x-rays and stuff you most of the residents on here you're probably going to be using the type twos or threes for your primary total hips ah okay and and can you tell uh, maybe you can tell most people can even tell the difference between this kind of tapered round stem on x-ray or or you know can you tell just looking at an x-ray that is, that's the type of stem it is. Well, yeah. I mean, you just kind of have to look at more x-rays. I think that's yeah. the key. Just look at more x-rays and look at the different ones and look at these papers. And um, you just have to get to know the different designs and see what it looks like. So they'll be approximately porous coated, just like your type twos and threes are, but they have like sort of a more rounded shoulder usually. And then I think that um, I'm going to say this wrong. That's why Mueller stem has those like dots in the corner. So that's sort of the class. Oh yeah. This one. Yeah, yeah the, dot, the dots guy. Um, the so that's dots. sort of another one. You go like, oh yeah, those dots. So uh, very scientific method. Very, very scientific <laughs> way to recognize there. it. Okay, okay, awesome. So again, those are just again those like tapered stems. And do the do most type two or threes have those like proximal fins or ribs, or is that more? which you'll see in like these rounder or yeah, I think that's a sort of a more special thing to those. I think okay. the, the two threes, they're just going to have porous coating proximally to allow for metaphyseal in group. Okay. And now, so we, we really, I mean, talked about the stems that get you more of your fit in the metaphysis of the bone where you have to have good metaphyseal bone. Now, what about, I guess now we're moving, switching into, I guess our type fives or, more our diaphyseal engaging stems. Can you kind of touch a bit uh, about, you know, kind of these stems, what we need to know about them and when you would use them? So, yeah, so the, it says it in the name, they engage, they engage the diaphysis. And that can be in a situation where you don't have good bone proximally, whether for a primary hip, like, or a conversion hip, maybe if you're converting from like a failed um, IM nail or something, and you got to take out that hardware and the proximal bone is not good anymore um, or a revision. Um, and then again, you're, if, you've, if you're revising something, you know that proximal bone is not going to be good. So you're going to need to engage in the diaphysis. So that's kind of where you would use these types of stems. Okay. And, and any difference, you know, again, the, there are different types of designs to the stems one where you kind of have these spine slash cone stems versus it being cylindrical what would it what, is there anything that would make you choose one or the other or is it just more just um preference or yeah like what you like to use <laughs> what right. you're familiar with using but they both can be used in similar situations um the sort of cylindrical fully porous coated ones are like I guess they're both super hard to get out, but they're like notoriously hard to remove. Um, if you have to get out one of those, you're, you're basically thinking an ETO down the entire step, which is right. like half of your femur gone. The other thing for those um, fully porous coated, like five B ones is they can um, have been associated with thigh pain um, in some studies. So that's another thing. I don't know if that's testable or not, but um, that's just sort of the standard thought about these is those um cylindrical fully polaris coated stems can be associated with thigh pain but they're course, they're been used in primaries they can be used in revisions so it's kind of cool in that sense it's sort of a workhorse stem but um if you look at you know long-term outcomes are for primaries similar with those versus your um proximally porous coated like two three stems like i think it to me it makes sense to use those because you're losing less bone and they're easier to get out if you need to take them out. Ah, okay. And again, cause these are typically, again, are, some of these diaphyseal fitting stems are typically coated almost the whole way. You know, they're almost coated down the entire um, prosthesis. And I guess that is a, a point that you just made these diaphyseal fitting stems. There is a concern for thigh pain, which I've read before as well as some stress shielding. And can you quickly just touch base on why this stress shielding happens or can you explain it in a way that maybe our intern second year can just understand this? I could definitely explain things in a simple way. I just make sure you fact check <laughs> this after go to Snopes, be like, this was she correct in the way she described this. So we'll um, do. You we all remember Wolf's law, right? It's our like favorite law of orthopedics. Yes. Um, basically uh, that like bone forms 
in response to stress, essentially, more or less. Um, so you could kind of reverse Wolf's Law this in a way, because if normally, all right, so when you're like walking on your femur, like the part of the bone that's absorbing your weight is the calca, right? That's why like when you have a femoral neck fracture or like a, a fracture of the calca, it's not, it's not good, right? Because you're bearing weight through that. Um, and that's why when, if you, next time you're in a total hip, after they do the neck cut, look at that medial calca, you see it's thicker, right? Than the anterior and posterior bone. So the most of the weight bearing is going through the calca. Um, when you put in one of these fully porous coated stems, your fixation now migrates distally. So it's diaphyseal engaging. And so now that proximal calcar portion is not getting the same stress anymore, right? Because the fixation right. now is coming more distally. So that's the concept of it's shielded from stress as it were. Um, ah. So then the bone can kind of resorb because it's like, I'm not wanted here. And then it leaves. Um, <laughs> that's, that's my way of yeah. understanding it in my weird brain. So stress shielding, you'll notice, you'll see, and it's some, it's a way to like trick residents. Sometimes you'll be looking at an x-ray, you'll see a fully porous coated stem, and then I'll be like sneakily. So what's going on, you know, approximately and they'll be like, oh yeah, it's <laughs> loosening. But you say, no, that just because the bone is resorbed there, you know, it's not subsiding there, you know, the stem is still well fixed distally. That's just stress shielding. Ah, oh, okay. And, and looking and reading some of these implants have like the little collar part to it proximally i guess the transmit forces to the cow car does that do anything with stress shielding or is that just you know something for uh, for you know just for again i guess surgeon preference or any reason why you know again I, i'm just picturing in my head when i go to these meetings there's this table with 10 different <laughs> implants and he's trying to tell me right he or she i is think me about these i'll, I'll and... quote uh blades of glory where they're like nobody knows what it means it's provocative nah. gets the people going <laughs> gets the people going but <laughs> you got to have a smarter person on here than me to sort of tell people oh no why, this is going right? great we have callers or not <laughs> because that's still being debated right some people are pro collar. Some people are like, why would you have a collar in a cementless fixation? So I'm not, I'm not going to go down that road because it'll just, <laughs> it'll just take too long. Sounds great. And you quickly mentioned this a little bit earlier, but can we talk about the modular stem and in what cases, I guess, in your experience, are you going to use a modular stem? And I guess, I mean, I guess those are the, the big things, I guess, what we, we touched on what it was a little bit earlier, but again, so when are you going to use this, this modular stem? So first of all, with modularity, it's like, is that Spider-Man? I'm bad with the superheroes or whatever. It was like with great power comes great responsibility. So yeah, I feel like, like with, he, with he modular, with, with great modularity comes great, I don't know, risk of failure at the junctions. That's not good. <laughs> Let me workshop Sorry, that. I saw anyway, that in a movie somewhere. Exactly. Yeah, the point yeah. is the more modularity, the more potential there is, the more junctions for failure, right? So that's something you have to think about when you're deciding what stem to use. So that's number one. Number two, I just want to clarify that within the subtype of modularity, you can have proximally porous coated stems, you can have distally fixing, right? So modularity just means more than one part within the stem, like more than just stem plus ball. So just remember that when you say, oh, modular stem, that doesn't tell you anything about where the fixation is or what what mm. the indication is to use it or anything, right? So if you look at that type six within the modularity, like you can have a modular neck, which we can spend like a second on and then not talk about it anymore, but it's a modular neck is like still approximately coded like primary stem, but for some reason they thought it was a good idea to have different necks. Um, and those designs were not great. They can fail at that junction. Um, so those are not as common anymore. So, but yeah. it's good to like recognize it if you can recognize it on an x-ray. So the other type of modularity is like the SROM stem, which is that modular, you, so the, like you can divide that into three different parts. So there's like a, a modular cone part proximally where the fixation is. And then there's also a modular neck and shoulder that goes into that. And then a module, an additional distal part. So that's three different parts that you can adjust. So you can set the version, you can set your neck length, you can set how thick that proximal cone is supposed to be. You can set how, how wide that distal part is going to be. And this, I heard someone describe it as a desert Island stem. So if you could just bring one stem with you 
on your desert island, it would be this type of stem where you could adjust every possible um, aspect of it. And the indication for that is a lot of times with um, dysplasia where you have um, a lot of like excessive femoral aniversion. So like when you think about your single wedge, double wedge to a certain extent, or I mean, to any extent, right? The where you, the aniversion, your femoral aniversion or your position of your stem is essentially set by your native anatomy with those stems, with the twos and threes, the single wedge and the double wedge. You don't have much leeway with that. You have more leeway in a single wedge, right? That makes sense, right? Because it's just a thinner wedge. So you could eh, maybe adjust the version a little bit more than with your double wedge. Um, But to a certain extent, like that's your anatomy will tell you where that stem has to go. If you are doing a dysplastic hip where you have a ton of femoral aniversion and you use one of these primary stems, now you risk instability because you're having like a way crazy amount of, of version. So the advantage of the modularity, especially in this type of 6B modular body SROM type stem is that you can set, you can put your distal part and then you can adjust your aniversion uh, of the femoral component separate to where your distal part goes. So you're ah. not, you're not reliant on the native femoral anatomy to tell you where your stem has to go. And, and one question I had, are there modular stems where the implant the metal of choice is different like is like the stem titanium and then the body cobalt chrome and then the neck titanium again and and does that do any is there any differences or things that are noted between using like cobalt chrome for example versus titanium so i'm no i'm no metallurgist but in general (laughs) anytime you mix sort of different metals right that's a risk for problems um i believe it says in the paper though that the um, cobalt chrome ones has more like, just like with your, in your regular primaries, you have that trunnionosis, so you can have crevice corrosion and fretting. Um, and the titanium has a risk of cold welding. So you can't get those parts apart if you need ah. to. Okay. So th- that is, again, a modular stem you're going to use, um, like you said, for more, you know, complex um, uh, patients with different abna- abnormalities, or as far as anatomy, different levels of dysplasia. And, and again, it's good because you can you can fine tune your aniversion, your length, offset, whatever you need to. And femoral necks, I mean, the modular necks, not used as often, but the modular bodies are. I did want to sorry to clarify more because we didn't talk about the sort of subtype of that, of these like 6B. Yeah. So you have like the SROM we talked about that's like a different neck proximal body thing. And then... Um, distal stem you also have so that's three parts you also have the six b's that you're like your um reclaim or your restoration modular that's like the proximal body and a distal step so like a diaphyseal stem and a proximal body just two parts those are relatively more newer um and those are more as opposed to you know talk about you know use these um three part modular stems when you have ddh and you have um intact metaphyseal bone but the anatomy is weird these other types of stem where you would just have a distal fixing stem and a proximal body they're more useful for revisions or for example um like just bad metaphyseal bone so i guess that's the same thing so if you have let's say a vancouver b2 and you have to revise the stem you and you have a fracture around the stem you know that you can't rely on that metaphyseal bone anymore that revision right. stem should be not the type of three part s raw modular stem that relies stem that relies on proximal fixation but a modular stem that relies on distal or diaphyseal fixation so i just want to mm. clarify that again to emphasize that modularity does not imply fixation at any particular location you can have modular stems that are approximately fixing and you can have modular stems that are distal fixing so and then that type of stem that i was just talking about with the um, distal stem and proximal body that's your kind of go-to test answer for the b2 the vancouver b2s ah perfect and that is a another tidbit or another gem there that you just that you just gave us um and I think we have just one more type of stem, which I guess is an anatomic stem. And maybe can you quickly test based on what our what the I mean, anatomic again, stem is? It's trying to be cute. I guess I'm showing my <laughs> bias here. I just I feel like we figured out stems pretty well. Like we don't need to be cute. Um, but the idea is to try to mimic the native anatomy better. But they're still um, proximally porous coated like the other 
primary stamps. I don't, I haven't really seen them used as much. I don't know. Right. Yeah. And, and from what, at least that I've read, maybe you can, I can, you can tell me, you know, what, what you think, but from what else I've read that's that you see similar outcomes between cemented and cementless and the, at least the paper, uh, there was like no, not a no, but it was just poor evidence to support uh, use of most any other stems versus another, which is exactly what you were telling us a little bit earlier. Um, but a question I did ask for you is earlier you mentioned cementless. When do you use cement versus not cement? Are you looking at more just the quality of bone and the so-called door classification for when you're going to some cement, like, you know, for example, for a femoral neck fracture? Yeah. So this is a controversial thing. And if you ask different people, you'll get different answers. Right. So this is just me speaking for me. Um, But so first of all, going back to your point about similar outcomes, you cemented versus cementless, maybe over the long or like from a bird's eye view, but if you subdivide it into different groups, you, you find different answers. So there's literature that shows in the setting of geriatric femoral neck fractures, that there is decreased rate of intraoperative and sort of perioperative periprosthetic fractures when you use cement versus press fit. So that's one population. And then there's other studies looking at sort of elderly female patients or people with osteoporosis who seem to benefit more from cemented um, because of the decreased fracture risk. So that's one part. So for my part, you know, at this point, I will usually cement anytime there is a arthroplasty for a femoral neck fracture. So whether that's a total or a hemi, I guess my thought is if their bone is bad enough that they break like the strongest bone in their body from like falling off a chair or whatever, or low energy <laughs> injury, um, I think that deserves cement to me. Mm. Um, but again, you find people arguing, I know plenty of people who press fit everything. They say, you know, risk of um, the bone implant cement syndrome and um, operative time and not having a team that knows how to cement or not being facile with the... Um, technique itself. Those are all valid reasons. Um, but that's, that's my thought. Um, and then for primaries, for elective primaries, I, I look at the bone quality, as you say, the door classification, I just kind of get a gestalt and you look at whether it's A, B or C, whether it's like the champagne flute or the stove pipe. Um, and I've done cemented primary totals in like people in their fifties, right? Elective primaries because their bone was so bad. And then I got in there and I'm like, do not regret this. because It was just like not good bone. Right. Um, and then probably, and you'll see some people say 80, 75, but like, especially um, female patients over 75 generally um, is I think an indication to submit, but you find people who argue with you about that. Okay. Awesome. No, I appreciate you um, letting us know and kind of ex- breaking that down, at least your thoughts on it. And then Not another going, thing for yeah. the residents, sorry, I keep interrupting you. Um, no, go for it. We, I, I think everybody just assumes that how you do things at your institution is kind of how they are everywhere, which is another reason to, you know, train at different places to see how things are. But going back to the AJR, there's a great study from a few years ago comparing AJR data to registries around the world. And it shows that, you know, while we have a very high percentage of, um, cementless fixation, which I bet everybody here who's a resident listening here does mostly uncemented total hips in other countries, that percentage is way less. And they use cement even for, you know, younger patients and their bone quality is good, but they still use cement as a reliable with good outcomes. So just something to, um, to think about that just because this is the way we do it here, doesn't mean that's the way they do it everywhere. And it's necessarily the best way. No, I mean, that totally makes sense. And uh, I agree. It, you know, you see different things all throughout the world if you go to different places. And not like I have gone to many different places and operated throughout the world, but what I hear from you and from many other people are uh, very similar uh, words that are, that are said. It's so uh, sad, like because of COVID, I like travel by reading papers about international joint registries. That's like my way of traveling. So, so sad. So sad. But maybe I'm someday. hoping it comes back to uh, <laughs> normal here in the future. Normal we'll get plane out traveling. Again. We'll get out again someday. Well, Dr. Corner, I think this has been, you know, a great talk. Uh, we talked about the different types of femoral stems, when to use one versus the other. And for those that are listening, we're going to kind of transition to um, some x-rays that we'll try to describe the best that we can here and see if we can identify some of the different implants Dr. Cohen-Rosenblum has been so 
nice as to have a couple of x-rays for us to just take a look at. So if you're not and you're on the audio and you're at home uh, cooking food, check out the YouTube channel and you can follow along and see some of the different x-rays that we're talking about. Here was an example of um, the pre-op, right? So you see on this left side, you've got a kind of a weird deformity and some retained hardware. So, you know, one way to do that, I guess you could try to dig that hardware out. You could do an osteotomy, but another way to do it is to do one of these. Not a short stem. Yeah, short stem. Exactly. To sort of not have to deal with any of it. Yeah. I mean, it looks like they had good metaphyseal bone. Um, You can get a good fit there. You know, why not use a short stem? Right. So then the question becomes, how is this going to do in like 10, 15, 20 years? And I guess that remains to be seen. What stem do you think is you see here? What kind of stem is that? On the right side, it looks like a cylindrical, probably fully coated as a collar, um, diaphyseal fitting stem. Yeah, because you can see, so if you're looking for, okay, where's the porous cone? You have to look for like a subtle little bump. So if you look here, you see smooth, 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 smooth. And then here, you see how there's like a little step off ah, there? Down to the end, yes. So that's how you know, yeah, and you're, you're correct, you know, fully porous coated cylindrical stem. So what about this? What kind of stem is this? Let's see here. This looks like a... It is a uh, uncemented stem. Um, it looks like this may, it's hard to tell. I'm trying to tell if it's a single or a dual, um, dual And it's a wedge. little bit tough, but I'll show you in another one in a second. But yeah, now, what do you guess? 50, 50 chance. It's definitely I'm, a wedge. I'm, I'm going with, <laughs> I'm going with single. I'm going yeah, with yeah, a, that's right. a single, so it's just, it's a single wedge. You single can kind wedge. of see here it's rotated because this case was for sort of a different raisin, but um, see how that's sort of thin there rotated a lot but um, approximately coded yeah you can mm-hmm. see the approximately coded on the at least me a little bit better on the lateral you yeah see, exactly see the bump exactly so a single wedge approximately porous coded and then this would be i don't know it might it might be kind of subtle but what do you think this is let's see uncemented um partially coated it seems to be a is a dual wedge? Yes, yeah, so that's a double wedge. And it's you just got to get look at more of it. But you see how it fills up more of that metaphysis than the single right. wedge did. Looking at the lateral AP. Mm-hmm. I'm liking it. Okay. What about this one? All right. On the right-hand side, it looks like we have a... It looks like diaphyseal fitting modular stem, um, uncemented, and... Yeah, it looks like there's a modular shaft, bike shaft body and a modular, a different, you know, body neck as well. Right. So where's the fixation mostly? Actually, metaphyseal, huh? Yeah, um, exa- yeah exactly. So that's the one we were talking about. And I'll show you the um, pre-ops. But this is a dysplasia case where they did um, one of these modular stems to adjust for version and bring the length down bonus question what's going on here what is here you see there's a cable there you see there's like this is the now the operative side but there's like a lucency there what's what's this all yeah about? was that was that a prior osteotomy that was done before there what's this what, well what so it that? was actually a subtroke shortening osteotomy so like if you've got a bad dysplasia and then i'll show you so these are the pre-ops so you see, okay. this is like a crow four, right? So you have to, this is the native hip center and this cool, is man. the <laughs> where they are now. That's the case. And to bring it down, right? You gotta, you, you know, you can't bring it down without doing something to shorten because otherwise you're going to stretch your sciatic nerve too much. So you do a shortening osteotomy, shortening subtroke osteotomy and cut out enough, as much bone as you need to bring it down without messing with the nerve. So that's what that stuff was over here. Oh, Okay. And this, I like this because it like, you can see exactly how the osteotomy works, right? You make a cut, you make a cut, you put in your trials and like reduce the hip and then see where's the overlap. Oh, right? and, you just so, cut. and then cut out that much bone. Oh yeah. I've, I've never seen, I always see it as an answer on an OIT test. Right. I think nobody ever <laughs> explains to you how it actually works, but there's some good papers out there that talk about it, but yeah, it's, it's you, you cut and then you basically cut out 
all the, the, the overlapping bones so that you can reduce the hip without lengthening too much. Okay, what about this one? Let's see. This stem also looks like a, this looks like a diaphyseal fitting modular stem, not cemented. Uh, and maybe I can try to point it out for those at, at home watching. Um, but again, it looks like there's a modular junction at the shaft and the body, but it doesn't look like there's a different modular junction at the body and the neck. So it looks like that's all one piece. Right. I, yeah, great. So this is clearly that's it's engaging diaphyseally and sort of filling up that canal. And then you have the proximal body, which you can adjust to set your version however you want it. Uh, well, Dr. Cohen Rosenblum, I, again, I think this has been a great talk. Um, you know, we, we touched a, a good amount. Uh, we talked a little bit about the background of kind of stems in general, all the way from the monoblock. Uh, we talked about the different types of stems. We talked about in-growth on, uh, versus in-growth versus on-growth, different types of stem, when to use them. And we also went over some cases as well. Uh, anything you else you want the people listening to this to know or, you know, about, Again, just kind of just our femoral fixation of, of, of our stems and total hip arthroplasty. Well, if, first of all, if I don't sound smart on this, it's because of the editing. So it was all really good <laughs> until it was. got, it was malicious editing, just like a reality <laughs> show. Um, but no, thank you for having me on. I think um, just trying to remember how to recognize cementless versus cemented fixation on x-ray, looking where the porous coating is, if it's cementless, is it proximal? Is it distal? Is it full? looking for signs of modularity. Um, and I think that's kind of all you need to like stand out reading these x-rays, right? To, to know the difference between all those things um, as opposed to just being like, it's a total hip. If you volunteer that information, this is a cementless total hip with a proximally porous coated stem. You could say likely single wet, you know what I mean? You can, you can make right. guesses like that, but I think that just shows saying something like that just shows that you've thought about it and you understand the concept. So I would recommend just next time you're looking at an x-ray of a total hip or a hemi or whatever, just look at the stem and try to test yourself and see where is the fixation? Like, can I find, can I see where the cement is? If it's cemented, can I see the edge of that little, that little bump that shows me where the porous coating is? Um, can I recognize the modular junctions where the modularity is? So it's just the more x-rays you look at, the better, the better you'll get at it. Um, and then knowing the indications, which generally, super generalizing, um, shorties for weird anatomy that you, with intact metaphyseal bone that you don't wanna deal with an osteotomy. Um, single wedge or double wedge proximally porous coated stem, most regular primary total hips. Um, modular, like three-part modular with s -ron, like a separate neck body and stem with proximal porous coating would be more for like a dysplasia picture where the metaphyseal bone is intact, but the um, anatomy is weird. And then modular, two-part modular pro proximal, por uh, proximal body and then distal stem, that's gonna be for most revisions and especially revisions for Vancouver B2 periprosthetic femur fractures. And of, of course, there's like more details we can go into of all the other types, but I think those are the main takeaways in terms of stem types and indications. So if you know enough to recognize um, DDH on an x-ray and then recommend a modular stem, like you're like ahead of the game, right? Because <laughs> that shows number one, you can recognize deviation. Number two, you understand there's going to be a mismatch with your anatomy that you're going to have to adjust your femoral anaversion separate um, to account for that. And that, that then that you suggest modularity shows that you understand that. So knowing those indications, those basic stem types, I think will, will serve you well. That's awesome. And, and at the end of these, we always give our guests away for our uh, listeners to reach out to them or follow you. If you have some social media that you would like people to follow you on or anything, feel free to uh, let the people know about it. Oh, that's, that's great. So I have my one thing. This is so embarrassing. So I, I have my one thing is Twitter. I don't do Instagram or like Facebook or whatever. It's at ah, ACR it. underscore ND. So that is me on Twitter. But like more than that, like who cares what I, I had, like my random thoughts about, you know, being a surgeon mom or some article I read more than that, you know, I'm really involved in, in AUKUS in the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons, the young arthroplasty group. Um, so I would check out, I, this is so cheesy, but to plug my own podcast on your yeah, podcast. No, go for it. Talk podcast, about it. 
So we have a young arthroplasty group podcast called The Augment because we love our puns. Um, so that you can listen to on the AUKUS Amplified channel. Um, and then just if you are a resident or a fellow um, or a surgeon in your first five years in practice and you want to join the young arthroplasty group, you can join us just by going on the AUKUS website and join us there. Um, I'm also involved in the women in arthroplasty group. So if you're a woman and you're interested in arthroplasty and you're a med student, resident, fellow, or a surgeon, um, just you can join us also on the AUKUS website. Um, Ruth Jackson Orthopedic Society is another a great organization um, to support women surgeons and the Gladden Society and Nth Dimensions are other ways to support um, underrepresented minorities in orthopedics. There's like so many things to, to advertise and plug and ways to support people. Um, oh, and then I can plug Antonia Chen's podcast, the Your Cases on Hold. That's a great podcast as well. Um, stop the podcast now and go listen to that one. Um, it's actually <laughs> been a way for me to keep up with... Um, my JBGS because I used to like, I like, I'm kind of old in the way that I like the print journals because right. I think I'm more likely to read them. So I still get the print JBGS and JOA and JOS or whatever. But um, I was definitely behind on my JBGS because I would be more likely to read journal of arthroplasty, uh, you know, because it's more kind of relevant to my practice. But now that they have that podcast out there, it's really engaging. It makes me want to actually read the articles. And I have, you can ask my husband who's in charge of like throwing out all the journal or recycling the journals when they pile up too much. I've definitely kept up with them more now since that podcast come out. So that was, that's a great one too. Um, and of course your podcast, everyone should listen oh, to that. Thank you. <laughs> There's so many podcasts to listen to out there and so many great ways to be involved in orthopedics. And yeah, so I think you're doing such a great thing having this out there with all these educational concepts. So um, great job. And thank you again for having me on. No, thank you for coming on. Welcome back anytime. And again, thank you uh, so much for being a guest. Those that are listening, please go and leave a, a review and let us know how much you enjoy this episode, how much you learned about some different uh, femoral implants and hit the subscribe button so you can hear us next week. And check us again on YouTube channel. You can hear me fumble over a couple of different uh, cases. So, <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Or really if do. you really, you can go back to the middle. If you're like having trouble sleeping, you know, just like go back <laughs> to the middle. You're anxious. Play that part where like go on about different modularities and stuff. That'll probably, it's very soothing. It'll probably help you sleep. So that's oh, another advantage. It was great. Well, everybody until next time.